Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday. Hey, guys. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Aloha. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey. I hope you're all well. Yeah, we're doing well. Are you in Hawaii also? Yeah, I'm just hoping this thing goes around us. Well, the Oahu people are the ones that are left. <laughs> I don't know about Honolulu. I think they might get hit a little bit from the way the weather's moving, but. Yeah, I hope not. Yeah, I know. I hope you're, you're not gonna get hit, so. Yeah. Two. What time does meditation start? At two? Yep. It's already okay. started. A couple more minutes. Oh, it already started. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're just letting people in. You know, oh, it takes okay. a it takes a while for people to come in. Okay. I'll yeah. be patient. Good to see everybody. <laughs> oh, wow, great. I love this part. <laughs> mm. It's my big social event of the week. <laughs> wow. Other than the grocery store, this is it. <laughs> Entertaining your cats. In the yes, garage. petting the cat. <laughs> petting the cat outside. <laughs> oh, it's great to see you. Are they still as feral as always? Well, because I'm not traveling. Um, one of them that has ne in 10 years has never let me pet her, let me pet her a little bit. At 10, at 10 o'clock at night, she allows me to pet her a few times. So that's a huge, huge change. It's really, it's like her degree of intimacy has taken a huge shift. So it's a good result of the virus. <laughs> the others are the same, but good. They like the, they like the stay at home. <laughs> Wow, look at everybody. Well, what do you think, Jesse? Yeah. Steve, you ready, everybody? That's good. Great to see you. Hmm. Wow, I like getting to see you. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the the flow has slowed down. Hmm, okay, so I'll meet you guys. All right. So um, yeah, we'll get started on our uh, the meditation portion of the program this afternoon. And. Um, Today I thought we'd offer a little something um, a little bit different than our kind of normal Vipassana practice um, and do a little exploration of a certain approach to the equanimity practice um, that we use as part of the continuum of the, the four Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And um, right now it, it sort of comes from a place of just, just knowing that there's so much intensity in so many realms of our lives at this point um, on the planet. And um, it takes so many forms in terms of, um, you know, the excitement and hardship and stress very personally 
uh, whether that's in the mind and body, whether that's in our families and friend groups, uh, you know, phenomena on the sort of societal level in this country and in the world. Um, you know, there's so much going on that's, um, you know, livening for the mind, nerve wracking, exciting, um, enraging, um, hopeful, you know, that, that full spectrum is really out there and, um, and alive with all of us. And so I think, you know, we have a, a range of practices in this tradition and this, uh, this form and, you know, while the Vipassana practice is our main approach to the cultivation of wisdom, of understanding, of deepening the capacity of the mind to, to be with this range of sensations and range of experience in wholesome, healthy ways that deepen our capacity to care, deepen our capacity to be at peace. Um, you know, there are, there are times where it is helpful to focus on the different qualities of mind that can arise and often we will tend outside of the vipassana to focus on the cultivation of loving kindness um, or of compassion and usually the appreciation the joy and the equanimity don't get as much uh, airtime. and um, just just for the sake of today i think that i was really just inspired by some you know recent conversations and events and just you know internal and external practice around this question of when we are impacted by suffering and hardship in our own lives, in the world, the lives of others, um, and we, we seek to address it, I think that it's always important to look at what is the flavor of that energy of addressing it. And to what degree is our desire to address suffering coming out of the fact that we can't actually, we don't feel like we can be with it. We don't feel like we can bear the intensity of our sadness or our anger or um, grief, you know, what have you. Um, and because we don't feel like we can be, do, be with it in a, in a way that's connected, but still stable, um, we might rush to try to change, to try to fix, to kind of externalize. And what, how does that impact the action? How does that impact the flavor of our doing, of our relationship to our bodies, to our mind, to people, to the world around us? And what might be the value of um, developing and cultivating this capacity of equanimity to help strengthen, give us resiliency, to have the sense of um, not denial of the joy and the pain of the world, deeply connected to it, but also feeling stable and strong and um, in balance with it. So as you come to, um, you know, find a position, a seated posture that feels um, relatively stable, relatively comfortable. And coming to let your eyes close. It's often very helpful, really just to check in to what feels most alive in the present moment experience right now. What are the most predominant sensations in the body, in the heart, mind, any other sense doors. And while with our Vipassana practice, we would really start to incline toward the sense of investigation of these phenomena. Oh, if there's a sensation in the body that feels predominant, how do we start to bring this quality of mindfulness, of investigation, exploring the 
dimensions of it, exploring the textures, flavors, tones. You can do that and sort of get a sense of what that flavor of mind is. Or if there's a predominant emotion or persistent thought stream. That approach of mindfulness would really start to be more investigative. And how would we describe the emotional tone of the heart and mind? How would we describe the reciprocal sensations we might feel in the body and the heart center? We wouldn't look at the content of the thought so much as the nature of thought. How insubstantial compared to the body, but yet how powerful. So we recognize this incredible observational capacity of the mind. And for today, we're going to start to also trust that place of not so much exploring and investigating and bringing those qualities of mindfulness to these experiences, but starting to see if we can attune to any quality of mind that's just accepting of them. It doesn't need to feel like it's investigating. It doesn't need to feel like it has to do anything with them to increase or decrease. It accepts the fact of their existence, their arising and their passing. And inclines toward a kind of coolness of heart. sense of stability amid the change. And so we can of course begin with just trying to sort of see if we can find any connection to that place of rest in the heart and the mind that meets whatever has arisen in the body, the emotional world, the sound. Doesn't deny it. Doesn't try to deny its qualities. But is also rooted in a peace that is not invested in it. So we can start to bring the attention just into the realm of physical sensation. And we recognize that we receive this current of body formation. Sensations happening all throughout. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. And the mind can see to what degree it feels like it can simply just accept them. But 
pressure, tightness, hardness, warmth, coolness. All these and more will arise. You might notice the mind has a preference to one or the other, but we can accept that as well. Of course, the mind has preference. Of course, there's wanting and not wanting. Of course, there's pleasant and unpleasant. Can we receive them all as simply the current of body and the sail of the mind? Where the heart is simply like a kite. Sensitive, supple. with the places of strength and stability, receiving these winds of body sensation, just with this acceptance, this is as it is. The body is as it is. At any place where it feels like we have any small connection to this place of acceptance, we let ourselves feel the relief of that, the coolness of this equanimity, the light balance. And peace with this range of physical sensation. With each moment of pressure, tension, tingling, Just acceptance, not clinging, not rejecting. And finding the flexibility, sensitivity and stability. We can receive sensations of sound in the same way. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. Some remind us of pleasant or unpleasant thing. The stream of sound out of our control. The mind simply can receive them. These gusts billowing. Without investigating, without clinging or running, receiving, accepting and feeling the relief of that acceptance. Any relief, any quietude, drinking of that.
this heart and mind that long for peace. You see the ways that it can be quenched moment by moment. Receiving sound with equanimity. This is, it's okay. This is okay. The heart. Just receiving. Deepening its sense of ease and stability. With each physical sensation, with each sound sensation. And with the activity of the mind. Just receiving it as another current of air. This jet stream of fabrication. Planning, worrying, thinking, wondering. Not needing to turn it off, not needing to buy into it. With each emotion, accepting. The heart can bear. There's a need to make it go away. To deepen the sense of acceptance. There's a need to make the thoughts go away. The ideas, the perceptions. Just as the condor that only needs to flap its wings once to travel a hundred miles doesn't stay rigid, is flexible and sensitive and attuned to every current. The mind has this ability each sensation of body, of sound, smelling, taste, visual impression, mind and heart. We can receive with this quietude and acceptance. Things are as they are. When there's any sense of that flavor of peace, of equanimity, allowing ourselves to drink from it, to be nourished, to abide in it as long as it's available. And when it dissipates, finding the next current to ride in whatever sense store it arises in. finding it and writing it back to this place of peace.
So of course, there's always more to say about all these practices, but um, you know, keep. It's always worth exploring. Maybe I will just say that the if if you're new to these Brahma Viharas or the equanimity practice, to understand that they're not designed to cultivate wisdom in the same way that the Vipassana or mindfulness practices, where you're really investigating the nature of objects and watching their arising and passing. Uh, by focusing on equanimity or cultivating love and kindness, we're not necessarily developing that same capacity of, of mindfulness and investigation and wisdom through understanding, but we are deepening our ability to kind of cut these channels of the mind to start to um, develop a, a, an inclination toward these beautiful qualities of mind in response to the range of emotion. And um, it is helpful to, to learn to be able to get a taste of these um, different beautiful qualities. Um, so I'll hand it over to Steve, uh, who's going to offer our Dhamma talk today. Steve, yeah, I think you have to unmute there. Thanks, Jesse. Welcome, Sunday sitters. Can you hear? More? More volume? You can't hear? I can hear pretty well. It seems like... Um, I got you loud and clear. Yeah, I think you're fine, Steve. Good. Maybe I just... I, 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 have a, I have a better contraption. My thumbs up meant good as it is. Sorry. <laughs> Better? Yeah. yeah, good. Okay. The wind is a bit wild here today. So I hope that doesn't deflect from the sound. I, I'm in Honolulu for a, a week attending to some things. So I'm back in a familiar place, my childhood home. Uh, and there's an ohana our extended family house in the back with a family, young couple and their young kids. Uh, so listening to Jesse talk about these easeful qualities, these equanimously attuned um, you know, light touches that connect with phen phenomena, not striving, not stagnating, and so forth. It reminded me of a couple things. It reminded me of one of my uh, favorite talks that Upandita gives around an early uh, and ancient Buddhist discourse. But it also reminded me that it, I was sitting the other day Day before yesterday, uh, in this living room, quiet and peaceful, um, touching in and out of that easy, middle, equanimous-like state, more on the vipassana side of equanimity than the Brahma Vihara stillness. Fortunately, because I suddenly heard some screams come from out on the street. And I, I recognize the scream coming from a young Foxy, seven-year-old boy who lives in the Ohana house in the back of this yard here. And it, I, sometimes he just screams because he's seven years old and he's a boy. <laughs> but then I heard his sister, Ku'umanu, uh, struggling too, trying to calm him down and trying to do something, whatever his situation was. I thought they were playing still. And then I heard her say, 
can you stay here? I'm gonna go get my dad. I'm gonna go get dad. And then it, it took me eight or 11 seconds to be out there on the street. And what happens every couple of Fridays is that uh, we take these big refuse bins filled with refuse from the garden, coconut fronds, coconuts, and pretty and grass cuttings and whatnot, and take them out to the road for to be picked up uh, Saturday mornings. And, and Foxy had pulled out this big bin and I, I, he was pulling it over the side of the driveway and stepping into the asphalt street. And I think Kuumano must have been pushing from behind. Anyway, it's bigger than he is and it toppled over on top of him, sandwiching him you know, onto the asphalt road. So this big green garbage bin and the black asphalt and Foxy sandwiched in between. Uh, I checked him out for any injury and by that time Kuumano was starting to laugh and I, I saw that he wasn't injured but scared and maybe a little embarrassed and uh, so I, I, I lifted this heavy bit off and lifted it off him and he, he squirmed out free and we, I checked him out. His little body was clean of any bumps or bruises or scratches, cuts and whatnot. And then Ku'u Manu and I laughed a little more. And, and this thought came to me, oh, I should have gone and gotten my camera. I should have taken a picture. No one would believe this. It's, it was a, there was an angle that, of it that was so hilarious, so funny, so precious. And Foxy too started to laugh. And so later I was telling Michelle this. And I said, you know what? It reminded me of uh, at the lake retreat once, these friends of ours, uh, Tim and Caroline, who live out in North Kohala, the northeast end of the Big Island, they were there. Uh, Tim wasn't maybe just turning 80, and Caroline's a little younger. And uh, in those days, the, the, the walkway uh, on, these, on this floating retreat center where the walkways were rickety and they had a lot of holes in them and easily dry rotted. And so Tim was um, kind of balancing himself, walking back to his cottage and he was still, he was fully clothed. Uh, he started to lose his balance. And uh, I saw all this from behind Caroline, his wife. And I saw that Caroline was two steps from grabbing him and saving him. Instead, she grabbed her camera to take a picture of Tim. He's very tall, just like a co coconut tree, just slowly lumbering over and splashing into the lake, fully clothed. <laughs> and um, it was you know, half horror and, and half humor. And Tim came up laughing and Caroline was laughing and uh, they managed to be able to enjoy that photo for many years to come. So I was thinking when Jesse was leading the meditation that um, one can be quite absorbed at times in the more peaceful qualities of heart that come up in meditation you know, so equanimous that it could have been just like hearing, hearing and, and not actually acting out of what's one, what, you know, the hearing that that's a call, cry for help and acting on that. Um, so then it reminded me of, of Upandita's love of telling this, uh, this uh, short simile from the Samyutta Nikaya, the, the first sutta of this ancient text. Uh, and it, it's a story of a, a celestial being, Devata, coming up to the Buddha and saying to the Buddha, how dear sir, how dear sir, did you cross the flood? What's the flood? Well, the flood is the flood of greed, hatred, delusion. 
how dear sir did you the awakened one cross the flood by not halting friend and by not straining i crossed the flood responded the buddha but how is it dear sir the devata asked that by not halting and by not straining you cross the flood and the buddha answered when i came to a standstill friend then i sank but when i struggled then i got swept away it is this way friend that by not halting and by not straining i crossed the flood So often Sayada Upandita would go on to talk about uh, the subtlety of this middle path, this middle path that we follow, path of mindfulness, this eightfold path of love and understanding. Uh, it's subtlety lying uh, for me in, in the mystery of the non-identification with ourself, with time, with location or space, time and space are, are fictions. Um, it was important that time and space not be a fiction when I was sitting here uh, on Friday and the garbage bin had fallen over on Foxy. It was important that I acted on, on that perception um, of a cry for help. But in, from, from the deepest meditative perspective. It, it supersedes or goes beyond the fiction of extremes, of opposites. That's why it's called the middle path. It's not because it's between this or that, between uh, struggle and, and uh, stagnation, or between indulgence and pleasure or indulgence and pain. It goes beyond those that perceptive fiction altogether and understands, you know, truly understands, knows the difference between uh, what is a perception from, say, day-to-day -day reality that we need to respond to, to nurture ourselves and protect ourselves and nurture others and protect others, and what is the way that leads us to the, the ultimate truth, to neither straining and struggling uh, and then being swept away or by being too stagnant and sinking. So that middle way is uh, beyond the extremes and, and beyond uh, being caught in the perceptions of, of this and that. It's a more profound understanding that ultimately, uh, as Upandita spoke about, um, to be identified with their, a, a permanent, solid, separate self, or to be identified with the concept of time, or the concept of, of space, location, is, is where there's suffering. That attachment to what's not ultimately there. That degree of insight into um, the ultimate reality, not the conventional reality, but to the ultimate reality is where we have a moment of profound rest. We wake up, seclusion. Deep, profound relaxation, where there is a cessation of the rounds of identification and grasping and the resulting entanglement, suffering of the heart, entanglement of the mind. So if we're struggling, if we're overreaching, if we're pushing, if we're driven in our effort to be aware, to be centered, to be present, then we're caught by the erroneous view that there's somewhere to get to. Gertrude Stein, the um, early 20th century great writer, you've probably heard this, but uh, the great line, 
there is no there there. There is no there there. <laughs> so when we when we act and think and emote and plan our lives around something being so permanently and utterly in a location, in a space, whether it's oneself or an object, a micro object, atomic object, so small, we can never see it, it's already gone. Uh, though we can sense in our body, the atomic level of the bodily energy field. And as Jesse was saying in the meditation, even more so, the speed with which mental phenomena appear and vanish. It's almost like looking at air. The moment awareness touches anything, like a thought bubble, it's gone, it's evaporated. Only if there's identification does it continue to stitch together uh, a seemingly solid story where we place our identified self and our likes and dislikes, our attachments and fears. And then it becomes an entanglement. It becomes, becomes something we may struggle against, strain against, or the opposite, where we just stand in stagnation and, and sink. It's a very steadiness of mind uh, that Jesse was talking about, where we get a, we have a sense that this heart, mind, or chitta in the Buddhist Pali, um, has no location and does not exist in, in time, in ordinary time, does not exist from one moment to the other. Uh, and as well, material things has no locality. There is no there, there, that whatever it is we look at, no matter how seemingly solid it is, if we relax and gently spread the wings of, of awareness around and feel around and into it from within experience, we see the fiction of locality and we see the, the fiction of, of a, the perception of time passing by a, a past and a present and a future. That, that very, that very insight is liberating. And that's the difference between uh, a day-to-day -day conventional perception and an insight perception. An insight perception comes from our intuitive, our deep intuitive sense of, of being, of mind. And it comes in the moment that there is an illuminating experience where consciousness with mindfulness touches on a sound moment or a light moment when sound vibration touches the inner sensitivity of the ear or a light wave, the inner sensitivity of the eye or the elements like textures and temperature and vibration touch the sense organ, the, the receptors of the body. And in that moment, there's body consciousness. And in that moment, there's hearing consciousness. In that moment, there's seeing consciousness. Otherwise, there's no consciousness. It just comes together in a moment of experience. It doesn't depend on something solid being there all the time. That bird song isn't always there. It arises spontaneously due to conditions of that bird or that or the passing burst of wind outside. And the condition for the awareness to arise is as they all by nature come together and we have set the intention the intention to be mindful without the intention to be mindful all these realities are happening all the time but there's no intuitive insight awareness of them if there's no insight intuitive awareness of them there isn't that momentary rest release from the rounds of identification with the observer and what is observed, the knower and what's known. There's the identification with that, there's identification with the time and or the place, and, and we, we miss the reality altogether. If rather we're quiet 
are neither struggling nor stagnant, we're not straining, we're not sinking, we're at rest in the moment, <clears throat> calling up those, those easy, balanced, peaceful qualities. Then we touch in on moments without trying. We've let go of that, that there's no selfing happening. We've let go of that. There's no particular object we're trying to wrap our attention around. It's just moment to moment experience happening. And the relationship to them, we, we see, we get a glimpse. It's as if the mind goes right through all these fictions of time, space, and self. And for a moment, that samsaric rounds cease. The samsa samsaric round of, of clinging and an ignorance of what's true. And because of clean, clinging and ignorance, the habit of clinging continues because everyone seeks happiness, everyone seeks safety, everyone seeks protection. And usually, if we don't know better, we seek it in this sense of a solid self, in this sense of, a, of time and space out there being real. And there, there, therefore, there's something we can hold on to. When we see that that's a fiction, there's just an utter release. In that moment of cessation, there's a deep and profound relinquishment, releasing. And that has a huge impact in our heart, in our consciousness stream that is returned to because once it's known that by seeing clearly, by not grasping, by this nature of things following their own way without straining, without struggle, without stagnating, without sinking, just seeing the as it is nature, there Therein lies that sense of, of rest, of true relaxation, of ease, of non-struggle. I'm gonna stop there so that we can just maybe contemplate that very short discourse and see how it might apply in our own practice or in our own lives. And maybe there are some questions about that, or questions about Jesse's instructions, questions for Michelle. Keep it short and sweet. Just a reminder to folks that um, the best way for us to know that you've got a question is for you to raise your hand on Zoom with this little button over on the right hand side if you go to the participants uh, list like uh, Julie has just raised her hand so um, it's hard for us to keep track of everyone um, visually so that's the easiest way for us to to have a sense so Julie are you there. Michelle, you have to unmute. I um, did. Yeah. Oh, just wanted to, when I can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just wanted you to all to uh, you might notice Amanda Waters between me and Steve. Um, she's helping with us. Uh, really, really wonderful volunteering to help us with the Zoom, and so Jesse's relieved of some of the duties of managing the site for the Zoom. So thank you, Amanda. Just wanted you guys thanks, to meet. Thanks, Amanda. Me. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Thank Lovely you. to have you. Gone. And so, yeah, just a reminder, really, that they be questions, not comments or um, so much your own offerings at this point. But if you have, yeah, questions about Steve's talk, about your practice, instructions. And Julie kind of disappeared. Maybe it was unintentional. Oh, hi, there you are. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Steve, can you give some examples of 
halting in the everyday or in meditation or just uh, what that would look like? Um, well, if we use one of the, the short lists, the models of what happens in the meditative mind, and there's the eightfold path of the seven qualities of awakening. <clears throat> there's also the five spiritual powers that, that go into play the very first moment we're mindful. Uh, and those are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Sometimes uh, the mindfulness can be replaced with equanimity. Uh, uh, we can use that instead of mindfulness because they're so related. The purest mindfulness comes out of equanimity. So this group starts to function together the moment we're mindful. It's like uh, the faith is when we, we could say, step into the present moment, this, this initial commitment. Uh, and that, that faith increases as our experience feeds back <clears throat> and affirms that, that um, affirms the experience that by stepping in to the present moment, we start to see the functioning of what's happening that arouses energy. And energy is what I would, if I were only going to pick one quality that takes us through stagnation or sinking, I would say it's this uh, quality of virya, courageous energy, that, that together with the other qualities keeps the attention growing, keeps the quality of awareness and wisdom uh, in motion. So the, and then followed, following the energy, the courageous energy is the awareness or equanimity <clears throat> that's firmly anchored in the present moment, seeing things clearly, receiving experience as it is. And the continuity of that uh, causes the mind to come together. The direct translation of uh, <clears throat> the word samadhi, usually translated as concentration, is, is perfectly put together. So it's like when every, everything about the mind flows together like rivulets into a pond, and the pond is suddenly this uh, coherence of stillness reflecting exactly what is, not scattered in myriad ways. And it's from that stillness, it's from that stability that we have glimpses of insight. And it's from that glimpse of insight, there is there's that release I was talking about that lifts us out of any stagnation. And it also keeps us, if we're struggling and straining, it, it pulls back that efforting uh, and that illusion that there's something out there to reach and brings everything back into balance. So from that, from that insight, then the, the faith is affirmed from experience, from one's direct experience, and it becomes more like confidence, and that grows more into trust. And the energy becomes more courageous uh, and spreading out into all areas of our practice. It, it would be energy primarily that I would say keeps us either from, from sinking or in the case of straining and struggling, to pull back on that. So it's a healthy, good Dhamma energy, balanced energy and effort, not striving, not driven, but also not stagnant, not sinking. So just think of groupings that come together. <clears throat> In this case, the faith, the energy, the mindfulness or equanimity, or the concentrated mind or stable mind, and then the insight, wisdom, intuitive knowing. That's, that's what functions. Nothing that we do or don't do exactly. <clears throat> so to kind of step out of the frame that there's something to do or undo or not do is most helpful. Thank you. Michelle? You're pointing at something, Michelle. I was pointing at that I had a thought. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, 
I think this is a very good question and also just such a- Michelle, will you move your mic up just a little? Um, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a very good question, very good subject. Um, one, another approach to halting could be when we um, say no to what's happening, right? So that resistance versus acceptance, it's kind of going on the theme with what Jesse talked about and Steve, but you know, these are all different languagings, but, but you can feel the difference between acceptance is when we're going through, going with that flow of pleasant, unpleasant and neutral experience. And one way you can see halting is when we attach to something pleasant or um, resist something unpleasant because that's actually trying to control or halt what's happening. Do you see what I'm saying so far? So that um, sometimes this is with very mild things. So I can give you an example. The other day I had an appointment in a town 30 minutes from where I live and uh, there was some unanticipated road work and I, my appointment was <laughs> at a specific time and, you know, hard to get that appointment. And this looked like such a long wait. Like it was really interesting always for me to go from thinking I have everything kind of planned and going according to plan. And then just that it was, it's like a literal halting, right? When you get that kind of road work where I live, there's no other options, you're stuck. And so um, we, we see ourselves with that with so many things. I mean, out here where I live in the big island, um, there's not as many supplies as uh, might be in a city in the stores where we shop. So, you know, you might think that you're gonna at least get rice um, or something so that you'll have a plan again and yet when you get there it's gone. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are many moments in life where we we say no and that that's halting but when we also it's not just a yes but a wanting to um, make something last. Uh, so I you know and there there's a very um, dear person to all of us who died on Monday, a young person. And the level of watching kind of that halting where you just wish this person didn't die, right? There, that, like that, that's the mortality and the, you know, the teaching around how do we open to that and flow with that and then watch the places where we resist it um, or attach that uh, what's very important here is that, and very hard to teach well, and I think again that Steve and Jesse are pointing to this, is that um, if there's resistance, if you're mindful of it, and there's energy, that, that courageous energy to be mindful of it and connect with it, then you're no longer halting. You're, the resistance has come, and if you're with that, you're back in the flow. Or if the attachment to something has appeared, it, it'll feel like you're halting, but actually if you're mindful and you have that courageous energy and you have that equanimity of accepting, accepting the resistance. It's basically, if you're accepting the halting, you're back in the flow. And so um, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very wonderful example of how one comes to that release and cessation. Yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Couldn't hear you, Jesse. Sorry, Samantha, are you there? Here we go. Mute. Yes, Hi. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Hi, I Samantha. think Michelle answered a little bit my question. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Yes. Good. So Steve, can you describe like um, in the moment that you said you were, I forgot what you said you were doing um, and you heard the little boy's voice and you made somehow intuitively got up to go help him. 
while in the Caroline and Tim story, she, instead of grabbing Tim, she grabbed the camera. Um, and I mean, I, I'm glad you helped the little boy, but you know, how, how did you know that you're supposed to get up to help him instead of let him, uh, I don't want to say get hurt, but you know, follow through with whatever it is that needed to happen instead. Do you understand my question? I think so. The scream went from a playful to blood curdling. Mm -hmm. Like it was a really a cry. It was definitely a cry for for help. And Kuumanu, who's ten, I I heard the I heard them playing with the garbage can, so I knew something went wrong at that point. It wasn't logical. It was like <laughs> I, I was here. What I was doing was I said I was doing was just meditating and hearing things. And then the next thing I knew, I was needed somewhere else. How did you know that? I don't know. It's just as, okay. it's as mysterious as as uh, as there being no ultimately no time or space or self. <laughs> it's all a mystery. But I've been around here long enough. I I know Foxy and I know his screams, and ninety percent of them are playful, you know, boy screams. That one wasn't. That one was a. I'm in trouble. I'm scared kind of stream. It's only like 30 feet away from where mm -hmm. I'm sitting. Okay. I mean, it sounds, Samantha, is that, is your question, oh. Samantha, is your question really about like, is it, is it a challenge for you to figure out when to attend to something and when not to in terms of mm -hmm. suffering outside of yourself? Right. Even inside myself. <laughs> the suffering yeah. inside or outside. I went to a, I mean, um, I guess my question is if there is a difference between this intuitive knowing that comes from that space where he was, Steve was sitting at, uh, because he was mindful at the moment and the times that we think it's an intuition and a decision and it turns out to be that we are, uh, resisting going with the flow, like Michelle was saying. And I guess the answer is sit more Samantha. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think Michelle was talking about um, a, a practice question from Julie about what does it mean to halt or to sink or to stagnate? And, and uh, yeah, I could have just halted and continued to observe hearing but i i felt a different i felt a different sound mm -hmm. i felt a danger call that took me out of just observing sound phenomena so in in the case i i i don't know if you're asking in practice or in, in practical situations knowing you it, they're one and the same you know, attending to something important with your children or how to attend to things when you're, when you're in sitting practice. Uh, it's really, it's learning to trust yourself. That's why that uh, those groupings of five, faith ultimately is, is unfettered trust. You have total trust in your practice, in your Dhamma within, in knowing what to do and having the courage to do it, and, and having the, st uh, the mindfulness and stability and wisdom. It just happens as a fruit of your practice. You, you don't need to stage it. You don't need to really think about it. I mean, yes, sometimes wise reflection gets us back on track. But all the years that you've been practicing, all the decades, I, I would say, I would mirror to you that, and validate to you that you... you are in that place where you can trust an inner mechanism that knows what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Okay. 
That's more than I needed. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Just, just to bring in, but it, I don't think it's as connected to what, oh, sorry. Just to bring in, um, the Buddha taught clear comprehension of purpose, and it's an aspect of mindfulness. And I think sometimes if you take the example that Steve gave, just as it is where, you know, you're sitting and you hear a sound um, that is clearly um, something unpleasant is going on, uh, the shifting to clear comprehension of purpose would be shifting to the conceptual, right? So that um, you might be noticing, you know, light tingling and texture and the and then there's a uh, something very more intense sound there's a certain point where the the mind shifts to conceptual where it would be um i need to go see if this is okay right that the buddha described that as shifting to a con concept it's like if you're driving a car and you're just going along driving but there's a stoplight or a stop sign that stop sign is conceptual but you're you could be noticing non-conceptual reality you could be noticing the textures on the steering wheel and sound but you gotta shift to stopping right like there's a shift to conceptual and that that dance um, in something like attending to all the myriad um, calls for help that arise in the course of a day, um, a lot of the time we don't know. You know, sometimes I might attend to something, whether it's an email, never mind, a, you know, an emergency um, where it turns out I actually didn't need to do that but but you know it, it, those are sort of minor but I think that the interesting part that I think Steve brought up is trust it's like the trusting that um, whether we made a mistake or not that the ideas that you um, you have that clear comprehension of purpose you, you follow it, that, that you don't um, reject that as not a, an aspect of mindfulness in life, that it's part of mindfulness in life. Thank you. I think I just wanna offer as like sort of the broader, all of the implications of these sort of dynamics are vast in terms of this practice and in terms of being people who are not mostly in seclusion <clears throat> and what does that dance look like and what is our responsibility to ourselves what's responsibility to whatever might be in the world around us and I, I think that it's as lay people who are living in the world to whatever degree or not around responsibility of many different things that these are tensions that are going to arise and I think that question of like you know, if Steve had been uh, in a kind of secluded, when we try to go into periods of long-term practice, right? When we're trying to do intensive meditation retreats, for example, often part of the idea is to create conditions under which you're not going to be needed, right? To be attending to putting out fires. And so there's a, that's why there's a, there's a sense that like, we need to be able to be unhooked from some level of responsibility to be able to externally, to feel we can be fully responsible to ourselves internally. And so that question of like, so that question shouldn't, to have spaces where that question isn't needed to be asked of ourselves of, we're not hearing the screams, we're not hearing the fire engines, we're not hearing all of the emergencies that are beckoning us, or we might feel some call toward that periods of time where we're in our own, responsible to our internal lives is important, you know? And then here we are in, in our lives and then COVID and people can't go to retreat centers and we're trying to practice under sort of conditions that might not be so protected, might not be so secluded, that these are things that we're all having to deal with in terms of as yogis in more intensive ways. And then there's just like our lives and that sense of whether if we're feeling the responsibility to always be called to put out fires and always called to be attending to the pain of others, 
that sense of like, where is it because we chose to live amidst all of the screaming and the pain and the fires. And so therefore that's the comma we have. And where have we chosen to be less involved and more self-protected and where is it not choice, but it's befallen us. Um, you know, all of these things are sort of important, but to recognize like, okay, well, if we're living in, in the realm of more of the attuned to the needs of us in the world around us, that those calls are going to keep happening. And if, if it feels exhausting, if it feels tiring, if it feels like we're not having enough sort of time and energy and space and protection for ourselves, then there's that question of like, well, where, where do we start to feel some power to adjust the, the conditions under which we're practicing life? And, you know, it's always an ongoing question as, as to like, where, where do we have any capacity to change and where do we, accept and have that equanimity with the reality of like, oh no, these are responsibilities we have. This person's scream is actually something I feel responsible for and that we're always going to get off, off the cushion to go help because that's a, a choice and a comma we've, we've taken on. So I think it's, it's like, like everyone is saying, it's not just a one-time decision. It's, it is a constant, there's the intuitive part of it. There's the conception, you know, the, thinking it out part of it. There's the life part of it. There's the practice part of it. There's so many layers to, to the dimensions of the question of where are we responsible internally? Where are we responsible externally? Where is the focusing on one a betrayal of the other? And where do we take responsibility for that? Thank you, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, Kathy was having a hard time getting her re Zoom hand to raise, so she asked a question here. Uh, is it enough to know that one is halting in the moment uh, without getting into resisting or acting? She said Michelle can answer any teacher. So if you find yourself sort of halting or frozen or st whatever that the phrase was from the sutta, is it enough to simply know that? Um, yeah, and the, the reason oh, I was yeah. asking is that, you know, when Steve brought up, maybe somebody else, oh, oh you know what, Harry and I are on different, we're, we're feedbacking on each other. Oh, okay, so the reason I asked is that it was the example of when you're halting and then you're just sinking, you know, versus if you're moving forward, you know, it was at the analogy. So... You know, is that moving forward versus, and how do you get someplace, right? And then if you're halting, you're just like gonna sink. So my, and I think because Samantha, that was really helpful, you know, the question that Samantha asked, because I think a lot of us, you know, have that feeling of wanting to give and often, you know, within the Sangha, I know that are at the giving and the giving and not knowing you know, what the boundaries are because we are in situations where we're able to give a lot and at the same time when I look at others I go okay that's enough and then they're probably saying that about me and so you know that's you know a legitimate question and Jesse you know very eloquently just now responded but you know my question came from not just the theoretical but you know, even in everyday life, before the pandemic, before the hurricane, before everything, it's that same question about, you know, when you're halting, do you sink? You know, and at some point you're deciding, you know, because it seems that when you're halting, you're in the moment and that's a moment of wisdom. Or is that not really, am I misinterpreting? Just to clarify how the, how the simile is being used by the Buddha. He's asked by a deva, how did you cross the floods of greed, hatred, and delusion? And the Buddha said, by neither struggling and straining, nor by, and therefore being swept away, nor by halting and stagnating, sinking. In other words, neither of those extremes. Just to, to, to put, to clarify how the example is used in its original context. Mm 
when we're talking about consciousness, recognizing in the moment. Now I need your speaker. We need your speaker. Your microphone. I'm unmuted, so I don't. You still can't hear me. It might be that your hand is covering the oh. something. Okay, so can yeah. you? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So when we're talking about halting, not in the, that Buddha thing, we're talking about knowing we're in that moment of trying to decide. Usually, by knowing, if you mean if you mean uh, insightful, direct awareness, kind of knowing, that's all it takes to to not be stuck. Halting in the sense of being stuck, being frozen, thinking. So just the awareness of that, perhaps along with the clear comprehension that Michelle spoke of, where we just say, am I stuck here? Am I thinking? Ask ourselves the question without answering it. It's enough just to ask and let wisdom come in and know what to do. Okay. And kind of like Steve was saying before about how, uh, th like, the mind isn't consistent through time and the body isn't consistent through time and space. It's like the same kind of thing where, like, if you feel frozen and there's that sense of stuckness or, like, that, that, that um, haltedness, right, that it's like, oh, you're not moving forward, you're not necessarily panicking and freaking out, but there's, like, a sort of stuckness there, being aware of that and being aware of that and being aware of that every moment is a different awareness. And so there is, and that part of the pasana is really getting that it's actually not quite the same experience each moment, that it's arising and there's different flavors, there's different dimensions. It's, it's arising and passing over time. And so, yeah, that, that awareness of stuckness is not stuck, I think is, is part of like the question, right? It's like, yeah, actually bringing that attention to it actually unsticks us, even if that, experience persists it's like oh no there's you're with it you're with the changing nature of it and that that still can that's actually again moving you know with the process yeah michelle i think your, that, your mic again oh sorry um thank you jesse um if I think there's so much richness that's come out of this, and I think that the metaphors can get confusing sometimes, but I, if you're asking, I'm checking, Kathy, if you're asking if there's um, more suffering to attend to than one can do, is that what you're asking? Somewhere along that line, because, you know, Samantha seemed to be saying, how do you decide? Right. And, you know, it just seems sometimes there are too many decisions. And, you know, being aversive, it's hard for <laughs> me. Harry just goes, just decide. Right. And he's <laughs> good at making decisions and moving forward. You know, that's the kind of couple we are. And then he goes, you just decide. Don't ask me about it anymore but you know i that and it's you know nowadays it's constant so right. and then i think am i stuck in stuckness or am i stuck in every moment there's something to decide did you know and oh yeah it's the same but i guess just, just the saying it's not the same but it feels the same because it's the same. <laughs> it's persistent. It's persistent. pattern. <laughs> the same pattern to different <laughs> moments and different experience, but the, a right. familiar pattern. Yeah. Up. So you're asking about that right. familiar pattern. Right. And so is that, I mean, I mean, maybe Jesse's saying it's not the same, but I'm sorry. You know, I, <laughs> it feels the same because, yeah. Yeah. That's well, I mean. Sarah. Yeah, you can look more closely. I mean, a part of it is just like, it's like if there's perseverating around a certain decision and then there's perseverating in another decision and like it's the persever, you don't like that, that patterning. It's like sometimes it is just a matter of going a little bit underneath it. And it's like, oh, is there an emotional quality? Is there anxiety? Is there fear? Is there wanting? Is there frustration? Yeah. What, what is that? And like, I mean, it's not just me saying it. I would say that the Buddha really said, <laughs> like everything is always changing. And so like, if you look closely somewhere in there, you're going to see change, but it requires uh, like, sometimes it's, it's, it's so hard to get out of our usual relationship to our own patterning. 
you know, I mean, to our own minds. And, well, and, you know. and there's a level, like, it's not, just, it's not just the annoying parts of ourselves that are stuck. It, it, there's, a, there's another level of, like, any sense of me or mine is that place of stuckness, of, of resistance, something about the nature of things that are happening. So that's partly why it's like when the mind is like perfectly still and perfectly equanimous and perfectly mindful and perfectly <laughs> everything thinks, and it's like, oh, everything is just flowing and there's not contraction or tension around any of it. Yes, the sense of self doesn't arise and we're perfectly enlightened and we've crossed the flood and like things are great. And until then, we're doing what you're doing. <laughs> like we're all like negotiating this, you know, yeah. So I guess, of course, the thing is, is that knowing that every moment is different and seeing that every moment is different. And, you know, it's like, okay, this is my life. That's how I, that's, that's just the way it is, <laughs> you know. I mean, I can live with that. I was just hoping for a better answer. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, again, all these questions are so, they can um, lead us many places. And, and so I think that sense of checking, if I don't, if the answer to the not being sure I don't know is okay yes. or that you feel like you always should say yes even if you're too tired or if saying no is too hard I mean you, you start getting into motivation and um, it, it gets like again very rich rather than judging that it's hard to decide right I mean that's the thing is that is if there's any judgment about that you're um, having a hard time deciding. Usually when I can't decide, I, I take time to look at motivation. And if I'm, the tendency for me is to over, like try to do more than I can do. Um, so, so right there, I, it's the two extremes. Right, you have to keep struggle, looking at it. Yeah. Struggle yeah. and sink are two sides of the same polarity. Okay. So just that, realizing that yeah. makes more space. Thank you. Well, if there aren't any more uh, pressing questions today, we could uh, call it a day and be on our way as if we'd like. Michelle, Steve, what do you all think? Nice to sit together with you. That's how I feel. I think it's too hard to decide. <laughs> 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 if there's no more questions it's it is it's really nice to um, be together i hope the hurricane doesn't uh isn't too bad in honolulu i don't know what's going to happen there is it raining or windy there it's windy and little gusts of rain, but the hard rain hasn't come. Hmm. Okay, yeah, well. I'm on the Kauai. Hope yeah. everyone stays safe. Everybody worry about Kauai. Yeah. Mm. All right, take care, everyone. Mm. Wonderful to see you. Amanda, again, thank you so much. Huge yes. help to not thank have you. to be Thanks, watching Amanda. all the flashing. Thank you. <laughs> have a great week. We'll see you Sunday, next Sunday. Much love. Mm -hmm. Aloha. Aloha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.